I'm Julie Bolthouse. I'm the Deputy Director of Land Use here at PEC. Um, PEC is a nonprofit organization formed in 1972 that covers a nine county region from Loudoun uh, in Clark County all the way down to Albemarle County um, in our south. And our mission is to promote and protect natural resources, the rural economy, history and beauty of the Virginia Piedmont. We take a very holistic approach to our mission though, empowering residents in a wide variety of ways to pursue a positive vision for the region's future. Our 40 person staff works to conserve land, create thriving communities, strengthen rural economies, celebrate uh, historic resources, protect air and water quality, build smart transportation networks, promote sustainable energy choices, restore wildlife habitat, and improve people's access to nature. So th that's why we have a 40 person staff because our mission is so broad and we cover so many areas. We are excited to have Tim Beatley with us here today um, to talk to you about how we can maintain nature in our, our urban environments and work towards more healthy and attractive communities where people want to live, work, and play. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Peter Krebs, who is our field representative from Charlottesville to introduce our guest speaker today. Thanks, Julie. Uh, when Julie told me that she had organized an event with Tim Beatley, I couldn't have been more excited. His work literally changed my life. About a decade ago, I was contemplating a career change and a friend recommended that I check out his, uh, Tim's work. Uh, Tim let me audit his graduate level biophilic cities uh, course. And after the first session, I was hooked. I immediately enrolled in UVA's urban and environmental planning program and here I am today. What Tim and his colleagues in the biophilic cities movement accomplish is to start with the common sense notion that we are healthier, better versions of ourselves with everyday exposure to nature. And they back it up with scientific rigor. Tim takes the next step by, uh, by pairing the data with examples of solutions from around the globe of feasible ways to transform human settlements into healthy environments that improve lives. Tim is the Teresa Hines Professor at the University of Virginia where he has taught for more than 30 years. He helped to found the Global Biophilic Cities Network and is a mentor to many. Let's share some hands for Tim Beatley. Hey, well, thank you. Thank you, Peter. Can everyone hear me? Can you all hear me? Yes, good, wonderful. Okay, and you can see the screen. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Julie, and thank you, thank you, Peter. Uh, I'd forgotten th about uh, your auditing that class uh, some, some years ago, the biodiversity or the cities and nature class, I guess. That's really great to, to hear. Um, well, today I'm, I'm going to sort of introduce you to the idea of, of biophilic cities and, and a little bit of the philosophy behind it and, and also some practical examples of what uh, cities are doing. I, I know there's a um, a contingent of uh, maybe Leesburg people here. I was thinking about that this morning. I, I have a connection to Leesburg going, going back to uh, high school even and uh, have fond memories of flying into the Godfrey, Godfrey Field Airport there um, as a young uh, general aviation pilot back in those days. I, was, um, I had my pilot's license um, I think maybe even before my, well, no, I couldn't have had, I guess about the same time as my driver's license. Anyway, it was, um, that's, that's my memory. But I, I know that some of the issues um, of bigger cities may, may not seem as relevant. I, I think almost everything that I'm gonna mention today will have some relevance to, to Leesburg and, and other cities in, in Northern Virginia, but I have sprinkled in some, some, some smaller city uh, examples along the way. So um, I hope you become comfortable with this terminology, biophilic cities, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it and a little bit more about the history. So I am an urban planner and a lot of the work focuses around uh, sustainable cities, resilient cities, thinking about how cities um, are going to respond to uh, climate change. They're really daunting sort of challenges that we face. Uh, many of us argue for compact Act, uh, urban form and greater density, uh, the notion that we need to create walkable, bikeable, um, transit-friendly sort of communities 
dense and compact for a lot of people, that means that raises the question, can you have nature uh, in those kind of environments as well? We've got to have all those things together. So cities and nature take away the question mark from this uh, screen. We, we do believe actually that you can have that contact with, with nature. And that's uh, really at the heart of this idea of biophilia. Here is uh, definition, one of, of the definitions from uh, E.O. Wilson, Ed Wilson at Harvard, wasn't the first person to use the term biophilia, but he's really the one who's coined it in the way that we think of it today, this idea that we have co-evolved uh, with nature, that we are hardwired uh, to want and need that, that connection, that affiliation with the natural world, and to be fully happy to lead happy and meaningful lives, um, we've got to have that nature around us. And so we believe that this is a, a key planning and design challenge, an element. You can't just have nature uh, somewhere far away um, in a national park or somewhere that you visit maybe once or twice a year on a holiday. Nature is absolutely essential again for a happy, healthy, meaningful life. And it has to be all around us uh, where we spend the bulk of our time in our in our neighborhoods and near to where we're working. Well, here is Ed, Ed Wilson, um, wonderful quote, the human species has grown up in, in nature. This is uh, from uh, a wonderful uh, Stephen Kellert uh, uh, film called Biophilic Design. So that's at the heart of this. And as Peter mentioned, there is a lot of evidence and it's growing weekly, daily, it seems like. Uh, and we could spend the whole hour just talking about the, the evidence. Um, but for me, it's quite intuitive. When I think about the things in the world that uh, give me uh, pleasure and delight uh, and meaning, they are the things uh, in this picture. They're living things. They are trees and flowers and butterflies and birds. Uh, in water. These are all things that are, are biophilic and they're things that we uh, until recently have been in very close connection with in our, in our lives. Uh, and so it's not a big surprise then that the evidence shows pretty, pretty compellingly, at least for me, um, that we, we need and want that nature and that nature does so many wonderful things for us. So here's just one example. This is a bioscience um, article, a study showing the relationship between greener neighborhoods, neighborhoods with more uh, greenery, trees, birds, um, and the residents of those neighborhoods showing uh, uh, you know, less depression, less anxiety, less stress, a lot of uh, very similar evidence uh, coming from various parts of the world. Some of you may know about the idea of forest bathing and the work that the Japanese have been doing for many years that as you walk through a forest, at the end of that walk, uh, you will see a reduction in your stress horm hormone levels. That walk gives you a boost to your, to your immune system that the aerosols emitted by the pine trees in that forest uh, are gonna be uh, anti-cancer, cancer fighting. Um, so we get so many benefits from, from being in nature and having nature around us. There is a science uh, emerging around this. We don't entirely understand why nature uh, delivers these benefits, but we, we, again, it's not a surprise given how much time we've spent in close contact with nature. And clearly the shapes and forms of nature, the fractals we see in nature, fractals are these self-repeating shapes and forms, the, the a leaf of a tree that's a small version of the bow, a small version of the larger tree. Um, these we find throughout nature. And uh, Richard Taylor, who chairs the physics department at the University of Oregon, talks about fractal fluency, that humans have evolved a visual system to process those fractals. So when we look at trees, we look at, uh, at clouds or water waves and water and shoreline uh, images, those things that have uh, lots of fractals, um, we process that very, very easily. Um, and so uh, Richard talks about the idea of effortless looking. So not a big surprise that we want to watch um, and, um, you know, clouds, we want to see trees and, and that those things make us feel better uh, when, when, when we're able to, to be around them. The image on the left is an interesting uh, story from the UK where they're using birdsong uh, as a way of uh, testing for hearing loss. It's sort of less 
stressful method. And it's also meant to remind me about the emerging evidence around bird song. I'm going to talk about birds off and on over the course of the presentation. Uh, bird song is quite important to me. Um, and we now have examples of, of hospitals that are recording bird song and then playing it back um, at particularly stressful times when, when, when kids are going into surgery or getting inoculations or, or things like that. So there is uh, lots of power and, and importance to nature. Um, it is impossible to sort of summarize all of this literature, all of this research. I've tried multiple times. Uh, this was one effort to, to try to summarize a lot of it for a, a healthcare conference. Um, so all of the, the outcomes on the right are things that we find in evidence and, and in research. And, and uh, so we know that in the presence of nature, again, we see lower levels of depression, lower anxiety, lower levels of stress, improved mood, greater physical activity, the more natureful a city or neighborhood is, the more likely we're going to be outside and, and walking around and phys physically active, which has uh, major health benefits there. A lot of evidence that when you plant trees and you, you uh, invest in nature in cities, things like uh, crime rates go down and gun violence go goes down. Social isolation is, is reduced. We have a lot of evidence now uh, that in the presence of nature, we're more, li more likely to be generous, more likely to, to be cooperative, more likely to think longer term. So uh, I think there is a good case to make that, that we are better human beings in the presence of nature. So how to summarize all of these things, it's difficult. Um, in the Biophilic Cities group, we are often using the word flourishing. And I like that word a lot because it conveys both the, the pleasure and delight that we get from nature, but also the deeper meaning and purpose um, and the deeper connections to place and to, to each other that come about it as a result. I, we've been in this really stressful uh, pandemic, it seems like forever, uh, and uh, it's been really difficult for, for most of us, uh, uh, really around the world, right? It's, um, but if there is a silver lining, for me, it is the reconnection to nature, the appreciation of how essential uh, nature is to our lives and to, to be you know, to leading healthy and meaningful lives. So we have uh, been trying to kind of record what cities are doing in real time to, to adjust during the pandemic and to make that nature more accessible. These are images from partner cities in our Biofloat Cities Network, uh, Portland, Oregon on the left, Edmonton, Canada on the right. On the left is Forest Park, large park in Portland, and they have, during the pandemic, experienced unprecedented demand to be in that park. So they've had to adjust the movement patterns and, and created a sort of one-way movement through uh, the park to maximize the numbers of people that, that uh, experience that park. Um, it's really remarkable to see how, how the pandemic has, has literally hatched a new generation of people who uh, watch and love birds and, and listen to birds. Uh, here's a wonderful essay in the Washington Post by Wendy Paulson, who, who talks about you know, how in this bleak time, um, we get hope from, uh, from nature. Nature invites, inspires, nourishes, instructs, soothes, gladdens, fascinates, and delights, and much more uh, than that. So I'm hoping that, uh, again, the silver lining uh, once we are beyond the pandemic, um, that this lays a foundation for even more commitment to nature and even more uh, realization of, of how nature is not something optional. It's absolutely essential. So we have cities that are investing in nature for lots of reasons, um, and resilience is a big part of that. So anything, virtually anything you do to make a city more natureful, uh, whether that's um, bioswales and and rain gardens or green roofs or tree planting will make that city more resilient. These are images from uh, Rotterdam where they have subs been subsidizing the installation of green roofs and, and designing and building things like uh, water plazas or water squares, the image second from the left, the idea of outdoor spaces, gathering spaces, public space um, where you can experience outside and nature, but also designed to uh, collect and retain uh, stormwater. Uh, water management is a big issue for, uh, for Rotterdam. Um, so for me, nature also is this really important connective tissue between the past, the present, and the future. There I am standing next to a, a very old tree, 
few months ago in the Netherlands. A little bit later, I, I have a couple of slides about tree protection. I hope I get to them. Um, and I, I wanna make a pitch for, for every city to, to, to take a hard look at its tree protection codes and, and, and programs. But for me, uh, there is a need to protect those things, those existing elements of nature, particularly that, that are, are old and ancient trees are, are part of that. There's a wonderful James Canton um, a quote here where he talks about uh, touching the skin of the oak is it, it's possible to feel some tentative trace of those who've gone before. He's the author of this uh, new book, The Oak Papers. Uh, and for me, that's really important that we, these are time markers and they are members of our community. And they really, again, do connect us to the past and to the future. And, and they do a lot of other things, of course, particularly these large trees are sequestering a lot of carbon and doing a lot of, have a lot of ecological services that, that they're providing and can't really be replaced by planting lots of uh, small uh, seedlings. But we can circle back and talk more about that. So what is a biophilic city? Um, a biophilic city, we think, is a city that's full of biophilic buildings, right? I mean, we, we, we build, we design and build things in cities, right? There's a built environment. There has been this rise in uh, biophilic design, uh, designing the interior spaces and, and um, uh, spaces in and around a building uh, to, to, to bring more nature into those spaces. This is a, a wonderful cancer center actually in Toronto. We've gotten to know Ty Farrow, the architect. Uh, and there is some living nature. This is the lobby as you come into the, the hospital. Um, and you see this feeling of being in a forest, even though it's, it's laminated wood, uh, these wood uh, beams. So um, a lot of wonderful work going on around biophilic design. And I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this, but our, our uh, um, hero, Stephen Kellard, who's, who unfortunately has now passed away, uh, has this sort of framework of uh, biophilic design elements and attributes. And I won't go through, through it all, um, but it does provide a pretty compelling framework for, for um, challenging us to rethink how we design and build everything. And it is certainly about water and plants and animals, but it's also about botanical mo motifs and, um, and the things that you just saw in that uh, hospital. And it's about fractals and, and incorporating fractal, fractal designs into our, into our buildings. And, and of course, natural light and, um, and connecting to place. Um, and things like prospect and refuge. I'll circle back and talk about any of this later if there's interest. And awe, I'm gonna, I am gonna talk about awe later. So we have wonderful examples of um, biophilic buildings. This is one from our partner city, Pittsburgh. It's the Phipps Conservatories Center for uh, Sustainable Landscapes. You see the, the green roof. It's um, um, a lot of uh, greenery inside, operable windows. Uh, view, views of nature around the building, a lot of native uh, vegetation. We have been making short documentary films about these best case examples. Um, so I, if I forget to say this, do please take a look at our webpage. It's biophiliccities.org and there is a film page. And so a number of places along the way here, I'm gonna mention films and it would be great if you had the chance to watch them. We um, have, concluded that there's sort of a, a kind of five to seven or eight minute sweet spot where, um, where we capture story and, and where, where viewers are, you know, kind of able to spend that, that much time absorbing a, a wonderful story like this. So that's one we have a film about. Uh, another wonderful example that we also have a short film about is the new interface carpet uh, headquarters in Atlanta. This is a biophilic building in lots of ways, um, but the most dramatic uh, feature is this exterior, which is a series of panel, panels of glass wrapped in this polyester sheath in the design of a, a life-size forest, e eastern forest. And it's really a, a wonderful feature, uh, very biophilic and adds a lot to the surrounding uh, neighborhood and environment. Um, we're spending, we're, we, we're seeing more uh, designs like this one, a new one called Designers Walk in Toronto, um, incorporating several hundred trees in, uh, in a vertical forest. Uh, really interesting story, um, building on some of the work 
um, like the Bosco Verticale that some of you probably know about uh, in, uh, in Milan and Italy, one of the first places where this happened, uh, but improving on it in many ways. So the, the floor plates of this building actually have uh, tree, tree growing um, soil and growing space um, designed in from the beginning. So really, really interesting. And the other interesting story here is that the, with a lot of biophilic buildings, uh, the neighbors around in the neighborhood around the, the building actually have come to its defense um, and are supportive of it. So they actually want to see this building uh, completed and, and they, they, they see it as almost a kind of uh, vegetative hill um, adding to the nature in, in the neighborhood. So a biophilic city is a city where we're designing everything that we build around biophilic principles. Um, but it's more than that, right? It's, it's all of those spaces between and beyond the buildings. It's room or rooftop to region or bioregion and all of the scales in between. I will probably say that several times. It is certainly about buildings um, and it's certainly about parks, those kind of traditional places where we find nature in cities, but it's all, all kinds of other things. It's gardens and trees and birds and urban wildlife and trails and, and uh, you know, all kinds of, of, of ways of incorporating nature, protecting the nature that's already there. Uh, Biophilic City is a city that works to make those connections to the natural environment. It's also a city that emphasizes conservation. So we're facing global biodiversity lost. Uh, lost. There is an increasing recognition that cities have to play a role. And so that means um, making room uh, for other forms of life, for biodiversity. And for me, there is a strong uh, ethical component to, to this. Uh, and we frequently talk about this um, uh, using the word coexistence. So there's a, an ethical obligation to, to, to make room for many other uh, forms of life. And, and we are, and our communities and our quality of life is improved as a result of that. So uh, Singapore is uh, one of our original partner cities in the network, and uh, they continue to be an inspiration. They um, have always talked about, they for a long time talked about themselves as a garden city. There is a lot of nature, a lot of investment in nature. More recently, they've changed their motto to a city in a garden, which seems like a small change, but is really quite profound. And even more recently, they are, they are talking about themselves as a city in nature, and sometimes a biophilic city in nature, which seems a little bit redundant, but we like that, that redundancy. And putting in place a whole variety of, 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 of policies, planning uh, strategies to bring that about. So this is a new um, biophilic building. Uh, and in the Singapore planning system, when you build something like this, you have to at least replace the nature lost uh, at ground level by the footprint of the building. You have to at least include uh, the same amount of nature in the vertical realm. So in terms of sky parks and green rooftops and green walls and things like that, um, and there's a friendly competition now to see which building can, can provide more, a higher percentage um, of that vertical nature. So it's a really a great deal of innovation in, in, the, in the kind of vertical nature being designed and, 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 and uh, installed in, in, these, in these buildings. So Singapore sees itself uh, as an ecosystem. And, and so one of our uh, key visions here, key elements of this vision is immersive nature, that we, we want a city that doesn't just have uh, spots of nature, places to visit, but rather isn't, you know, sees itself as an ecosystem, which it is. Um, and so it's integrated, continuous, and seamless. It's in integrating the built and natural environments. It's a place of parks, yes, but we're thinking beyond parks. It's a place of biodiversity and, uh, and wildness. Wildness is one of those words that'll come up again. And a whole of city approach. Again, not just a building, not just a neighborhood, but the entire city, ideally at multiple scales that are interlocking and interconnecting. And it's whole of life. Uh, so you should experience that nature as a young person in the city and have that, those experiences through adulthood and, and into elderhood as we're calling it now. It's also about uh, social justice and social equity. It has to be just and inclusive, um, and it has to be a culture of biophilia. It's not just a city that has a lot of nature. It's also a city that, that uh, where residents connect with that nature 
and care for that in nature. So uh, here's an image of Helsinki, um, in their integrated green spaces network. Again, a whole of city approach from that building scale uh, all the way to the regional level. And Helsinki is a wonderful model of this. You can walk from a dense downtown all the way to old growth forests at the edge of that, at that city. So this is another way of saying a whole of life. Uh, so we're talking about an immersive, nature immersive city. We're also talking about full life immersion. And so for me, that means uh, immersion throughout your life in, in that uh, biophilic city. So these are images, by the way, of a wonderful charter school just outside Atlanta called the Chattahoochee Hills Charter School, where, which is designed to facilitate students being outside and connecting with nature. We have a, a, a six or seven minute film about this story on the webpage. So not one classroom, one building, but rather multiple buildings. Um, kids come with their boots and, and, their, uh, and their jackets and, and coats and, and they spend time outside and they take their math assignments and their English assignments out into the forest. And it's a working farm uh, as well. Anyway, it's a wonderful a story. We frequently talk about the nature in a city as a matrix, a matrix of urban nature. Um, and you can think about a couple of different continuums. Again, moving from seeing a city as having a few discrete points of nature that you have to go to to visit, to seeing it as an ecosystem, seeing it as a, a, an immersive natural system. Um, there's an indoor outdoor continuum as well. And we frequently argue that a biophilic city is one that propels us outside. We want to spend time outside. We need that outdoor nature. But we know the realities are that we spend a very high percentage of our day inside. So we also want to bring nature uh, indoors. And we want to uh, overcome those barriers between indoor and, and out of outdoors. Um, so there are a lot of different ways, of course, of thinking about the nature around us. Pittsburgh is one of our um, partner cities now on the Biophilic Cities Network, and these are some of the ways that they think about the nature. It's certainly water and, and rivers and uh, new parks in that city that allow residents to get down to that water. Uh, it's also forest cover, and there is quite, quite proud, quite impressive 42% tree canopy cover in that in that city, but it's also many other things. And the idea of looking at this image and seeing it in a new way, looking at that bridge, for example, and recognizing it's not just a human designed uh, engineered structure, it may also be a habitat, it may also be a nesting site for peregrine falcons, for example. So uh, Pittsburgh uh, is, um, I'm gonna start, I'll, I've got a couple of other uh, examples from Pittsburgh later. So the webpage uh, has a, a lot more information about what the cities are doing, a uh, wide range of different strategies and programs and different ways uh, that, that they're making themselves more natureful and biophilic. Um, for each of our 25 cities, there is a page that provides a lot more information, plans, documents, uh, web links and uh, and often a film uh, about that. So so I won't be able to cover all of this today, but um, do again do take a look at the web page. Um, it is interesting. Nature can take many forms, and and uh, even very small nature. We have wonderful stories of greening alleyways and um, conversion of portions of sidewalks to nature, tiny spaces, parklets uh, in places like San Francisco that have a lot of power all the way again to regional uh, and, and larger scales. So there is in a biophilic city abundant nature spaces and ideally they are connected. So connectivity, both ecological connectivity and human connectivity are very important in biophilic cities. What you're seeing here um, is part of the human connectivity. This is Singapore again, and they have a 350 kilometer uh, park connectors network um, that, that allows you to move uh, through the city, through the city state and reach nature and uh, experience nature all along the way. This is one of my favorite stretches where you're actually walking elevated through a uh, forest canopy. Um, a lot of really creative work in cities like San Francisco, another of our partner cities, um, they have had for many years a street parks initiative 
which allows uh, neighborhoods to take over the spaces between um, in the median strips between roads. And there are more than 100 street parks now, and you have to, as a neighborhood, come up with a design. You see one on the right here, uh, and then agree to sort of shepherd over it, steward over it uh, uh, you know, in the future. So wonderful way of bringing the community together uh, around designing uh, spaces and, and, and nature in your neighborhood. Jane Martin, um, that's another San Francisco example, has been uh, a leader in getting the city to create a new permit that allows neighborhoods to take up pavement. Um, these are all around her home in the Mission District in San Francisco, and there are now two, more than 2,000 of these uh, landscape permits, sidewalk landscape permits that have been issued. So sidewalks represent an opportunity. Um, here's an image from Antwerp in, in Belgium where they're talking of, about garden streets. So rethinking the, the street as not just a place for cars, uh, taking back a lot of that space or some of that space and planting things. I love the language of garden streets um, that conjures up, I think, uh, something that residents would, would definitely want. So. Um, nature can happen in a lot of other kinds of spaces, of course, right? Uh, it used to be that green rooftops were kind of a radical thing. And 20 years ago, uh, I came back from Europe and um, have been talking about green roofs ever since, uh, but now they're fairly mainstream. But I, I have to uh, talk about this example, San Francisco, the first American city to mandate green roofs uh, through their Better Roofs uh, Ordinance. So wonderful program. You either have to install a green roof or a solar roof or some combination of the two. A and really interesting new research around this combination, which is usually referred to as bio-solar, so that um, you can have the nature that actually the, the nature, the microhabitats, the greenery, uh, serves to cool the, the PV panels and they're actually more efficient. They produce more efficiently when, with the nature there. And the panels provide shading and create these sort of uh, different microhabitats. So it can actually be good for biodiversity as well. Uh, but it's a, a wonderful code. And one of the things that we do in the Bioflexies Network is to collect um, best practice and, and, and uh, model codes, model codes and ordinances and the Better Roos Ordinance is one of them. Um, we want to rewild as much of the city as we can. And this is a wonderful example from uh, Perth in Western Australia. We have a, 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 actually a, a film about this as well. Uh, conversion of a sterile energy intensive chlorinated water feature in the middle of the city into what is now a native biodiverse wetland. Uh, it's bird habitat, it's wonderful. Uh, space to, to uh, sit and, and uh, hang out in, but also the, a lot of public events that happen uh, around it. And there's even a stage um, integrated into this, uh, into this native wetland. Um, a, a lot of our cities are uh, thinking about lighting in some way. Pittsburgh um, took the step, uh, this was maybe a month ago, uh, of adopting a uh, dark sky uh, ordinance that's going to require um, full cutoff lights, uh, dark sky compliant lights in all of its parks and streets uh, over time. Um, this is a wonderful thing to do for lots of reasons, reducing our energy consumption, our carbon emissions. It's better for bats, it's better for birds. Um, and uh, we, you know, I think every city should really be following Pittsburgh's um, lead. The wildness of reconnecting to the night sky is something that you know we need to think more about in uh, in cities. The spaces around buildings. Um, we have wonderful uh, stories now of people rethinking, you know, their yards, their lawns, um, the emergence of of a different aesthetic around native gardening. It's still difficult. Um, these are a couple of images from Toronto, our newest. A partner city and uh, and our colleague Nina Marie Lister, who's a planning professor actually at Ryerson University, and who um, confronted firsthand um, the Toronto city bylaw that is called the uh, Tall Grass and Weeds uh, bylaw. And actually, she 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 installed this wonderful native garden around her home, which you see on the left. Uh, and was pretty quickly um, confronted with a fine 
basically telling her that this was a violation of the ordinance. And she almost single-handedly has started a conversation in the city. Uh, and, and actually recently, the, this has led to um, a change in the code basically saying that, that every resident has by right, uh, has, a, has a right um, to, to install, to plant a native garden in their, in their yard. Uh, so the wildness can happen in, in lots of different ways and we have a lot of our cities uh, thinking creatively about, about landscaping. Uh, Fremantle, another Western Australian example. This is a, a smaller city of about 30,000. It's so far our only Australian city in, uh, formally in the network. Um, they've been doing a lot of wonderful work. Um, they have a, 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 a native verges program, basically verges between the spaces between sidewalk and roadway and, uh, and a program for um, uh, facilitating and subsidizing the installation of native, native plants and, and, and local nurseries um, and seed, a seed bank, a local seed bank that's, that's really working on uh, um, making sure that the, they know the provenance of the, of the plantings that are being uh, planted in these places, but a wonderful initiative as well. Puri de Bat um, is our only city in Costa Rica, actually another sm smallish city of around 30,000. Uh, they have a program called Sweet City where they're basically reimagining all of the spaces in the city, spaces along sidewalks, uh, in parks. It's, it's a lot of that pollinator uh, pathways and pollinator uh, gardens. Um, and they have been winning all kinds of awards. So uh, here's one image, uh, what they call sweet sidewalks, where you have all of these wonderful native plants and these pollinator um, friendly uh, plantings, uh, creating this wonderful, you know, beautiful green walking environment for, uh, for residents uh, there. So their map of their city, you see on the left, um, beginning to sort of understand their city in terms of all of these interventions, all of these na natural elements, all of these kind of elements of plantings and, and, re and, and in the process really profoundly reimagining their, their city as a, as a place of nature and the immersive nature, again, back to that, that vision. Um, the Perry Gastez, the capital of the Basque Country in Spain has been one of our original 10 partner cities. Um, they are famous for their green ring that circles this compact dense city and now they are bringing the green ring into the interior of the city and here is a wonderful um, project where they've basically daylit a brought back to the surface a small river that was in a pipe underground and they've created this wonderful pedestrian uh, environment uh, around it. Um, as I said before our vision of a biophilic city is one that shares spaces with lots of other forms of life and biodiversity they're biodiverse cities. Um, lots of wonderful, inspiring stories. This is back to Singapore. Uh, you may have heard about their smooth-coated otters. Uh, there are now more than 80 of them and they've become beloved in the city. And uh, it's a wonderful story. Partly it is a function of investing in restoration and habitat restoration. The image on the left actually is a, a, a large park, Bishan Park, where they have converted a uh, sort of engineered flood channel into a beautiful meandering natural river. Uh, and that's largely why the, why, why the otters have, have returned. And the image on the left shows the other thing it, it does for Singapore, which is absorb a lot of floodwaters, which it, it, it's doing very well in this image. Um, Austin, Texas is in our network. Many of you probably know uh, the story behind the million and a half Mexican free-tailed bats that take up residence under the Congress Avenue Bridge in down, downtown Austin every, every summer. It, it's a wonderful story. A city that moved from seeing bats as uh, dangerous and a nuisance and wanting to eradicate them to the condition of cel celebrating them, sharing spaces with them. And they are a major tourism draw actually in that city. Edmonton, Canada is another of our partner cities, a city that is emphasizing that ecological connectivity in its planning and its design, kind of understanding the city from the perspective of an animal that would be moving uh, through it. Um, particularly impressive and probably no other city that has done as much of this, but uh, installing um, many wildlife passages of various sizes, making it easy for various wildlife to move 
uh, through the city and to avoid being uh, killed uh, or injured from by cars uh, in particular. So they have now passed 35 wildlife passages. I think the number is probably more than 35. This is one on the left from 2019. It was the newest passage, but incorporating this into all of their, their roadway design and infrastructure design uh, manuals so that ecological connectivity is a big part of it. And it's not just underpasses like that. It's thinking about tree canopy and thinking about landscape connectivity and using in Edmonton this idea of circuit uh, theory and like electric circuits, where are there places where there are blockages um, and, and looking at the city from the perspective of a chickadee, of a bird. You know, how are there places that you can't cross or don't wanna cross? And again, emphasizing this ecological connectivity in its, in its planning. So I have been doing a lot of work recently around birds. This is a new book called The Bird-Friendly City. We're maybe just a little bit beyond peak migration here in North America. Uh, it's a really important time to think about how cities can be bird-friendly. It has, of course, a lot to do with uh, glass and facades, uh, upwards of a billion birds a year are killed in the US alone from striking glass. Uh, but a lot of other things that make a building or make a, a city bird friendly, including, for example, turning off lights. So a number of uh, cities, 30 or more cities now have lights out programs where during migration, uh, those lights are turned off. It's a vol usually vol a voluntary program. This is an example of bird friendly design, the Jacob Javits Center retrofit, um, converting dangerous glass, uh, replacing it with fritted glass, glass that has a pattern, uh, pattern density that birds can see. And in this case, you know, more than 90% reduction in, in mortality of birds. And there's a green roof on the top and it helps reduce energy consumption and reduces um, carbon emissions. So it does a lot of different things for us. And so I've become very interested in how we can design buildings and design everything in a city that might just, you know, might have birds in mind. Um, this is an example from the book uh, of a restored historic building where they rebuilt a chimney and they designed in nesting spaces for common swifts and actually bats in the interior uh, spaces of the, of the chimney. So a biophilic city is one that thinks about birds uh, and is in awe of the things that we see, the nature around us. And I'm I, I would be remiss in not mentioning the importance of, of, the, um, of the experience of, of awe. And it isn't necessarily large things, always little things. Um, we have a lot of evidence actually that uh, as with a lot of nature, awe delivers things like generosity and kindness and provides a lot of benefits for us. Uh, here's Rich Louv's definition of awe, um, you know, an encounter um, with something unexpected a sense of vastness and possibility. Um, there are a number of other kind of associated ideas, discovery, curiosity, again, wildness, humility. Um, but we want cities that uh, foster these kinds of values. And I wanna live in a city where it might be, it's possible that I might catch a glimpse of a humpback whale. Um, so this, these are images of the example of a nonprofit called Gotham Whale in, in New York. We have, a, we have a short film about this on the webpage as well. Um, and the whole story of the return of uh, whales to the waters of, of New York. And it is a, a, a story of awe and, uh, and wonder. Again, uh, outdoor life, we want to propel us outside uh, how do we do that? Uh, we have examples of winter cities like Edmonton that are doing really creative things to get people out of doors in those winter months, including a, a comprehensive winter strategy and a set of winter design guidelines. How do we design spaces in the city to provide wind blocks and, and warming stations and opportunities to engage in skating? Uh, lots of cities have freeways. Edmonton talks about its freezeways, the idea of being able to skate from home to work, for example. And an ice castle that is a new design every year that you uh, must see if you are living in Edmonton. Okay, I think my only Charlottesville image 
is to just make the point about trees and circle back uh, and, and talking about trees, just as that um, there's that challenge to design in ways that uh, get people outside in the winter months in northern cities. Uh, we have a challenge, of course, especially in the summer, uh, to get people outside of the air conditioned spaces, right? Uh, and um, if you've visited or spent any time on the downtown mall, you'll know. Uh, for a while, I was mon I had this project where I was monitoring temperature and humidity, and in, in, during the summer especially, and it's 10 degrees or more, sometimes cooler, under that shaded uh, grouping of trees compared to you know other spaces outside the mall. Trees do these remarkable things for us, right? They are part of what makes it pleasant to be outside. And they are the place where we will uh, hear birdsong and see birds. So our downtown mall, there are more than 60 uh, trees now, but there you know, were 60, are 60 mature willow oaks planted as part of the original design. So I've become very interested in uh, and what cities are doing in the area of tree conservation, tree, tree protection. And we have a, lo a lot of um, variation in what cities are doing. So here is a slide about Asheville, North Carolina. Asheville is a city of about 90,000. So a little bit of a, a little bigger maybe than Le Leesburg, but a smallish city. Uh, they have a tree, tree protection program based around minimum canopy standards. So if you're a builder or developer, um, depending on where you are, where your project is, you will have to meet a certain minimum canopy requirement. Uh, pretty impressive uh, that they've already got 40, about 45%, 45% overall uh, canopy cover, but they are losing trees and they're losing a lot of trees at, at those sort of more suburban uh, fringes um, and uh, and so so there are other approaches um, and uh, places like Palo Alto uh, in California and this is a city of about 60 60,000 70,000 has one of the strongest tree protection ordinances I think um, anywhere uh, it is uh, heavily based around protecting certain really important uh, species of trees like coast live uh, oaks and laying out standards um, that you know allow allow the issuance of a permit to cut down a protected tree only under certain circumstances. So if the tree is dead, uh, or is hazardous, or is a detriment to, or crowding an adjacent protected tree, or constitutes a, a nuisance. So we could talk about tree conservation, tree tree uh, protection, and and many many cities like. Charlottesville that now have heritage tree uh, programs as well. Uh, so this is very much about a biophilic city also. I'm quickly running out of time, but uh, I, I do want to emphasize the importance of uh, what we call just biophilia, the, the social justice, the social equity dimensions of, the, of biophilic urbanism. Um, these are images from Richmond another of our partner cities, uh, but it's, they apply to many cities, of course, in the US that have a long history of systemic racism and redlining and where the current distribution of nature and tree canopy cover uh, follow, you know, reflects that, those long, that longstanding systemic racism. And so in cities uh, like Richmond, this new, new, their new comprehensive plan, uh, calls for minimum tree canopy targets, um, minimum, access to parks, uh, focus on underserved neighborhoods, uh, neighborhoods that are higher on the heat vulnerability index. And, uh, and I've been very impressed uh, recently with what's happening there to address this concern. There's the mayor, LeVar Stoney. Uh, they've created already five new parks uh, in underserved neighborhoods out of out of land already owned by the city. Um, and they're going to do more, I think, and the plan is quite impressive as well. So we're uh, trying to document those wonderful stories of cities that are working hard to address these inequities. Uh, we have a short film about Collie Park in Portland, a wonderful story of uh, an approach to park planning and again, in a neighborhood of color 
the underserved neighborhood didn't have a park. Um, and instead of the parks department designing and, and, and installing this park or building this park uh, from, from on high, uh, it became uh, uh, the neighborhoods, uh, you know, challenge to design it and build it and, and empowering the neighborhood, giving the, the, the neighborhood the, the power to, to do that and to um, imagine it and, and to make it their own. And, and, uh, and so, the, for example, the raised bed gardens that you see here on the left were designed uh, by kids and, and the, who, lived in the, who live in the neighborhood. Okay, um, there are so many other things that we could talk about, so many other aspects of, of um, what makes a biophilic city. Um, I won't obviously go through all of the metrics. We have a lot of metrics on the web page, and that's one of the requirements that cities joining as partner cities have to identify, um, select, or come up with a certain number of metrics from different categories, things that they're going to monitor and track over time. Um, mostly this image, the slide is to convey that it's uh, not just the presence or absence of nature. Again, it's all these other things. How, how engaged are residents with that nature? How much do they care about it? Are they able to identify common species of flora and fauna? Uh, what about the, um, the behavior and the decisions of the local government? What percentage or portion of a local budget is devoted to nature, uh, restoration, protection, connection? Uh, Reston is uh, also in our, our network, not, not, not precisely a, a city, but uh, really functions as a city and um, wonderful uh, programs to connect residents, including most recently this uh, um, biophilic pledge, which we love, encouraging folks to choose a certain number of things from this list that they can do, they can commit to. Uh, again, uh, the idea of um, engaging residents as a part of how we define what a, a biophilic city is. A wonderful program in St. Louis, another partner city, Milkweeds for Monarchs, challenging residents to plant uh, um, butterfly gar gardens. They had the goal of 250. Um, they've now got 400 or more of them. Uh, this is um, the sustainability director, then sustainability the director and mayor actually holding up this, this placard. Uh, wonderful programs. So just a, a final few slides about the network. Uh, you can join as a partner city. As I said, 25 cities, there is a, a set of joining requirements, uh, usually a council adopted resolution or proclamation, um, but you can also join the network as an individual. We have thou several thousand individuals who've done that and several hundred organizations that have done that. Usually there's a, a, a celebratory event when a city joins, and I often show up to hand a certificate uh, to somebody. Here, here is Mayor Peduto, the mayor of uh, Pittsburgh, uh, and we also get often really good news coverage. So when Birmingham and the UK joined the network, we got a really nice uh, story in The Guardian. So here is the most recent map. You will notice it is um, highly um, sort of uh, til tilting towards North America and Europe. Um, but we are hopeful to, you know, we want to expand it around the world. We, we hope to have more cities in, um, in Australia. We have one city in India. We hope to have more cities there, uh, China as well, and then of course Africa uh, and Latin America, uh, which we are uh, have quite a few cities that are interested in joining in Latin America. So uh, we do many things in the network um, and I can tell you more about that if you're interested. A lot of it has to do with sharing information, cities sharing insights, inspiring each other. We have an online journal uh, called Biophilic Cities. That's all the issues are, you can find on the webpage. Here's Bosco Verticali actually, that project I mentioned earlier on the cover of one of those issues. We are um, comparing, contrasting codes, collecting good, good practice um, here again, San Francisco on the left, uh, first city actually to have adopted mandatory bird safe design standards. We collaborate with other organizations. Um, here's a, 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 a lecture series we, we co-organized with the Smithsonian uh, a few years ago. Uh, again, filmmaking, short films, but also a few full-length documentary films, including one about Singapore, if you're, if you're interested. Here's uh, Grant Pearsall, the former uh, director of the Parks Department, 
Parks and Biodiversity Department in Edmonton. Uh, he appears in one of our films. Right before the pandemic started, we had um, a film festival, or we were part of the film festival, environmental film festival in Richmond, and that was also a chance to, to give their certificate. We work with cities in lots of different ways. This is a neighborhood, a biophilic neighborhood design workshop that we helped to organize and put on in Pittsburgh a couple of years ago. Um, the cities are doing wonderful things with each other. Um, sometimes they enter into agreements to work together around certain issues, um, collaborating in lots of interesting ways. Um, member cities host other member cities um, for visits. This is an image actually from San Francisco hosting their, in this image, hosting a delegation from Singapore who are there really to find out about the bird friendly design work that they uh, do. And then we organize other kinds of events over the course of the year, including an annual uh, leadership, su leadership summit uh, at our, our partner uh, community, Serenby, and, and the Biophilic in Institute there. So do take a, a look at the webpage. It's, uh, there's a lot there. We've launched uh, what we're calling a Biophilic Cities uh, Global Pattern Book or Global Pattern Library, a kind of crowdsourced um, crowdsourcing of unique nature patterns and, and unique approaches to uh, conserving, protecting, restoring nature from around the world, kind of based on the idea of the pattern language that uh, Chris, CRISPR Alexander uh, has written a lot about. So that's about it. I have, we are lots of books and lots of resources. We, that's another thing that we do as a sort of a, you know, a, um, scholarly element to this work. There's a, an early book about biophilic cities, a full length uh, film called The Nature of Cities. More recent um, book that, that actually has chapters on, on um, e each of the original 10 partner cities. So the, the handbook of biophilic city planning and design, another island press book and recently been translated into, uh, into Chinese. So that is all. I've used up about all, all of my time about the entire hour. So I'm willing to hang around if you've got questions or comments. Um, and sorry to be a little bit long-winded there, um, but I'm happy that I got through all my slides. Um, so I'm gonna stop sharing and uh, hopefully you're all still around and, and good to see some faces. Um, Julie and Peter, do we have any time for, for questions, comments? I'm willing to hang around. I don't know if you have a, a hard stop at so, one. Um, I'm going to go ahead and summarize one of the overarching questions, a little theme that I saw in, in several of the questions. And then if people okay. have to jump off, then that's fine. Um, and, and that's, okay. what are the challenges? What are the biggest challenges that you see with implementing bio? cities and getting started, getting started. One of the specific questions was cost. Cost. Yeah. Um, so get, getting started and, and connected to cost, uh, I, you know, frequently get this question, is it, is it bottom up? Is it top down? You know, how do, how do we get going? What do we do? And, and uh, I think there's so many ways to get started. And um, you know, there are things to do at an individual level, a family level, at a neighborhood level, you know, doing some of the, just, you know, rethinking your lawn um, is, a, is a marvelous start. Um, doing things, organizing at a neighborhood level, having a, um, you know, creating an organization and, a, and a, you know, getting people together to talk about nature. Um, at the sort of more top down, I mean, we have, as, as you've seen a lot of examples of uh, pilot projects, um, you know, cities taking little steps, but then often adopting a code, an ordinance, um, a citywide program. And so I'm, I'm of, of the mind right now that it's really great that we, we retrofit a single building so that it's bird friendly uh, but but the challenge is so great right now, and the the need is so great, and and the urgency is so uh, great that we need to you know where we can move to codes and mandates. Um, and sometimes you know they can be they, they certainly can also involve subsidies, uh, mandating green roofs, 
you know, it's one approach. You can also, you know, provide technical assistance and financial assistance. Singapore and other, many other examples. Um, those those investments um, more than pay off. Uh, we know that every almost everything you know that I presented today is in is in the category of mainstream design and planning. Um, and uh, some of it's a little different, you know, the conversion of that 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 water feature in into a uh, a native wetland in the middle of a city that's still pretty unusual. Um, and uh, so so far, that's been a success. Um, and uh, it, it involved a landscape architect, and 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 there were some technical, some engineering kind of issues. Um, but I wouldn't say very, you know, not a, not a huge hugely costly. Uh, project. So um, I think that, you know, that, that, that's an obstacle, often more, I think, a perceptual obstacle than, than uh, um, it's real, certainly. Um, but these are things that, that um, more than, you know, pay, pay, pay for themselves very quickly. So particularly starting, you know, kind of circling back to those images about health, health and well-being and, and uh, if, if you incorporate mental health and you uh, even life expectancy, you know these are these are things that are um, you know have huge uh, financial cost connected with them as well, um, as well as just human cost. And nature is such a such a cost effective uh, way of addressing these these issues. But but if I had to think kind of more generally about obstacles that we faced face in our biophilic cities network, I think it's, you know, it's often a lack of imagination. Um, that's why it's so powerful to be able to see what another city has done and that these things are possible. Um, to be able to see, you know, that you don't have to just have a, a chlorinated water, you know, sterile uh, feature. It can actually be something, an element of wildness. It can help birds and, and you know, be a, a, a really natureful kind of piece of your downtown. Kind of seeing that that's possible, I think. Uh, imagining your city as an ecosystem, um, maybe, maybe a reach for a, a lot of folks. Uh, the, the vision of immersive nature um, you know, I mean, we're, we're in a time when we're moving from renderings to, to kind of the reality of, 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 of seeing, you know, places like, like Singapore. So it's, that can really shift people's point, point, points of view. I know there are lots of, uh, you know, obstacles that, that are all, um, it's all possible. It's possible to overcome them all. Politics is another sort of thing. Who's going to be, uh, the champion uh, of this vision? And of the the projects, um, and we find that often a mayor, you know, um, can be that person, but it could also be a community leader or an organization. Um, some of our cities have joined the network in part because of a very active citizen group that's pushing pushing this agenda. Um, so, so those are some of the, the obstacles and some of the ways maybe to overcome them. Yeah, that's extremely helpful. I know in Leesburg, we are facing a number of the obstacles that you just mentioned. I won't go into depth on any of them, but um, I, I think that there's a lot of opportunity. One of the things that I saw in your presentation was that a lot of the localities almost use the biophilic cities as a sort of signature, um, as, a, as a theme within their community. And I think that that's something that would resonate within Leesburg in particular, because we have yeah. our art and cultural district, we have the historic uh, district downtown, and there's a big push for redevelopment. And I think there's an opportunity for Leesburg to integrate in that biophilic city yeah. kind of uh, concept into those things yeah. that are already existing. But anyways, um, moving on, um, I'm going to just go through questions if we okay. leave to everybody. Long, I haven't uh, looked at, haven't read them, but the yes, some I'm, good comments. I, on it. So. Yeah, I'll just go ahead and go through them because some of them have been sent directly to us. One of okay. them is about suburban development. And it's basically asking, well, suburban development seems to almost follow, note the quotes that I'm putting up here, <laughs> um, but the biophilic philosophy, um, because you often have more trees and open space because it's sprawled out everywhere. 
how yeah. um, how how does that compare to the biophilic cities concept and what are some good arguments against that development pattern but um, in support of the biophilic cities yeah um, I, I think you know we have this um, this impression that that uh, to, to get to the nature to if you you want that that connection to nature that you have to leave the city right and denser places uh, are going to be less natureful um, so part of it is part of the answer is we need to continue to work uh, on those uh, you know medium and higher density environments and 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 green them and and, re and naturalize them and rewild them in in the way in all those ways I've been talking about and and uh, it, it, it may be less about a um, you know ground level forest it may be more about a green roof or, or um, you know biosolar or maybe a green wall or it may be uh, lots of creative ways where trees can fit in, in, in medium and even high density um, environment. So, so that's part of what I, I'm, I'm, I'm my, my tendency is, is more to uh, focus on the positive things we can do to bring nature into those environments rather than to sort of demonize um, the suburban uh, development. Um, I, I do, you know, we, we do need to work on, on containing growth um, we need, we do need urban growth boundaries. We need, you know, a lot of our cities are working on that, uh, on that front as well. So partly the biophilic vision is about what we can do to protect nature that may be even beyond our borders. Um, and this is, a, you know, a, another subject, but the, we've been writing a lot about the, the idea of half earth cities. Um, as a kind of element of biophilic city. So we want to set half the earth at least aside. This is another Yo Wilson uh, idea. And so we need to be thinking about how our, how our land use patterns affect that, that larger environment. Uh, we wanna protect that, that forest. We'd ra rather it not be developed, right? In the first place, we'd rather you know, minimize the impact on that forest, uh, cluster development, find ways to to you know, minimize the impact. Maybe you know, think about our um, our ecological footprint. So, where is all, all the material, the energy, all the kind of things that we we you know draw from the larger world? Um, how can how can we um, adjust those things to protect nature, forests that might be far away? But that's another another uh, topic. Uh, I do think on the suburban question. You know, we do have this sort of, in some ways, a mythology that to get closer to nature, you've got to move further away from the center. The paradox, of course, is that that in in dense, compact European cities, the Torre Gestes in Spain that I mentioned, and places that I've lived, actually, uh, compactness and density actually, it, it, you're actually closer to nature. It's actually much easier to walk to some place, um, you know, to walk to that forest. Or, or ride a bicycle to that to that forest, um, rather than you know the, the sprawling environment where where to get somewhere, you've got your yard perhaps, but getting to any other kind of nature you know requires getting in a car and, and traveling a greater distance. So, um, and I mentioned the the Nina Marie Lister story in Toronto. I'm I'm a big fan, partly connected to birds. Uh, fan of the idea that we rethink the, you know, the American lawn and uh, um, e everyone should, should be uh, planting, in my opinion, you know, native gardens for a lot of reasons. And we can have a discussion about that. We need to be subsidizing that. We need to be encouraging that. We, um, if you haven't read any of Doug Tallamy's work um, about this, I highly recommend it. Um, you know, the his idea of the homegrown, you know, national park kind of, you know, if we, if we just set half of your yard aside for, for native species, uh, milkweed, and goldenrod, and, you know, um, things that birds need, and uh, native species of trees uh, as well, we would be accomplishing a lot uh, there. Absolutely. So um, that's a rambling answer, but no well, no, I, th I think that's wonderful. I mean, um, mowed lawn is actually, I remember reading a book where it basically was described as a barren wasteland for wildlife. So <laughs> I'm not sure that suburbia really is um, that um, no. 
biophilic. Um, but right. one of the other questions that we have here um, kind of goes into uh, social justice a, a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, basically, they're asking about community gardens and uh, where we install them We're in food deserts and in uh, very urban environments. There's often uh, people who are just struggling to keep the lights on and food on their table, and they don't necessarily have time to actually, you know, get out and grow their own food. And in terms of, uh, you know, just gardens in general, I mean, yeah. in these communities, it may be more difficult to get those sort of things in when people are just struggling to get to work every day. What is what is your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, well, I, I would actually argue that those are precisely the places where you need gardens. Um, and, and uh, you know, we have wonderful examples, gardens and, and orchards, for, for instance. And in Philadelphia, there's the Philly Orchard Project, which is uh, precisely aimed at um, neighborhoods that are uh, food insecure. And so it's empowering those neighborhoods. It's training people in the neighborhoods to, you know, learn how to how to maintain and and uh, manage and care for uh, fruit trees, for, for example. So uh, garden, we have a lot of you know really wonderful stories of garden. It's not going to be for everybody, and um, but it is a it is a a kind of social infrastructure um, that that helps to uplift everyone in in that in that neighborhood it's social connections and contact it's overcoming social isolation it's in um, um we have a, an example from from milwaukee where in a in an underserved neighborhood a uh community garden actually is is creating employment and, and jobs uh and I, I think that's really uh, promising as well so th this is shouldn't i don't think we should see gardens, orchards, green elements as necessarily some kind of uh, uh, frill, you know, that this takes time away from your busy schedule. It's, it's additive, it's transformative. It's, it's doing all this wonderful work that needs to happen in, in, these, in these places. And, and I started, you know, I talked a little bit about the, the park, you know, deficiencies of the, the uh, unfairness of, um, of the distribution of nature in parks. And, and community gardens are are a kind of nature, and they, they help to address that that uh, deficiency. Um, so I'm that that would be my argument that um, this is part of the answer rather than anything that would you know um, should be seen as a negative in one's neighborhood. Okay, wonderful answer. <laughs> uh, one uh, last question. This is uh, more for uh, our benefit in our nine county region because we have some oh. comp plan amendments happening right now. What do you Ooh. think is the most important um, aspect? And Peter, correct me if I'm not asking this question correctly because it was actually his question. But what do you think is the most important biophilic yeah. city's concept to integrate into your comp plan? Into the comp plan? Yeah. Um, well, we get a we get this question a lot of, about how you know how, how do you implement this vision? Where are the leverage points? Where how does it uh, find its way in into a local government? You know, and and uh, um, so uh, there there's several different answers to that. I think the conference of plan is a really good place to do that. And actually, we have my our program director J D Brown is is working on a PAS report. Um, actually, that will provide some guidance on on that. I would love to see a biophilic planning element, you know, in every comprehensive plan. Um, it, it's a, it's close, but not quite. It's close to what a natural resources or a green infrastructure element might might look like, and uh, be a lot of overlap there. So, Peter, I would. I mean, these are obvious things, but all the things that I've been talking about, um, you know, green, green spaces and uh, natural stormwater, you know, kinds of things, tree planting, um, green, green, you know, green urban design or biophilic urban design and, and, you know, lots of different ways ought to be, ought to be incorporated uh, and uh, represented and talked about and, and, and targets uh, provided for those kind of things in, in, a, in a plant. So the, the greenest city uh, um, plan in, for Toronto, for uh, Vancouver rather, 
is a is a good example of that. So I can you know we 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 ask our members to to adopt a certain set of indicators, um, certain metrics, um, and uh, and and I think it would be really wonderful in a comprehensive plan um, to to not not just go right to the specific targets of something. We want a tree canopy of fifty percent or whatever it is. That that's important. But to also start with the philosophy and, and the, the kind of vision. And I don't see as much of that in, in comprehensive plans. I, I would want to be inspired um, by, that, by that vision that's laid out in, 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 a, in a comp plan um, and this, this idea of, you know, of, of living in a forest, of, of, of a city that's immersed in nature. Um, you know, again, from the starting point of this is not some extra thing. It's not just an add-on to a long list of, of planning elements. It, it's, the, it's the center. It's the core. It's the thing that is, um, you know, from my biased point of view, perhaps most important for us to, to start with. Uh, and, and, and so, yeah, um, maybe that's enough. I mean, there, I, I, you know, I, I have some pet uh, Peeves about you know we don't talk we don't talk a, at all about birds for example in most comprehensive plans uh, I, I did a I did a sort of a twenty plan scan a couple months ago uh, big bigger cities not Virginia necessarily but um, and and you you know you, you can't find any references even to birds it's so sort of striking to me the things that are so important to people seem to be absent from from comprehensive plans. I don't know, Peter, what do you think? You're an expert too. Yeah, <laughs> so I actually do think you're, you're right about the, the comp plan it is a vision document. And um, so, so I think it, it's great to start with that. And in fact, um, list the, the biophilia premise as a whereas at the very beginning. Yeah. Of the Absolutely. Um, certainly, yeah. that when when I'm working tactically, that is one of my whereas is when whenever I'm talking about stuff. Um, I, I I also would say that um, we're about to re we in Charlottesville are about to mm. update the um, the zoning code. Yeah. And so I think I'll give JD a call. <laughs> that sounds like a good step. Yeah, we haven't been in, in, involved in that at all, uh, but only to the extent of as a as a resident, as a you know Green Greenbrier neighborhood person watching the watching all of the discussion around uh, um, yeah. Flum Flum. Yeah, the <laughs> future land use map. No, which has no become here. quite quite controversial. Yeah, and somebody that was concerned about that future land use map actually cited the um, the point of liking to hear birdsong in our, from our back. Oh, really? Oh, yes. Okay. So somebody so who I is opposed to the to the um, changes who is, to the, who is concerned about density about the density. Uh, yes. Yeah. So. Well, um, I thought I had a couple of slides about this. I guess I took them out, uh, but I, I'm frequently saying that that you know we need to we need different kinds of metrics, and uh, one of my favorites is the idea of uh, judging you know a good city by its bird song. So everybody and every every resident in every neighborhood in a city ought to be able to hear native bird song. That's one kind of really important measure of a good city. Um, and it can happen in, in does in downtown Charlottesville, right? It doesn't just happen in the leafier outlying neighborhoods. Um, so I don't know who was saying that, but, uh, you know, um, yeah, uh, that's a, that's a good standard to, to hold, you know, cities to, I think. Um, I'd, I'd also maybe, uh, recommend to the audience to check out the book or, or in the website. Another thing that, that Tim talks a lot about in his writing that he didn't get into so much here is that in some ways, actually cities are in advantageous positions uh, for biodiversity because 
Uh, cities offer verticality. They offer a lot of um, diverse temperature habitats. The yeah. seasons change in different ways. There, there's always water near cities. So in some ways, actually, cities could outperform the suburbs or yeah. outperform a rural landscape from a biophilic perspective. And that, that we designers should should really work to those strengths rather than trying to hide the yeah. fact that this is a city. Yeah, that's true. And, and in many parts of the world, um, you know, the pattern of development, the, the, the um, ways in which agriculture especially has kind of, you know, knocked down everything. And where do you find older trees uh, in places like New York City? It's, it's interesting. You know, one of the, the oldest poplar tree in the state is is um, right in the heart of the city. I mean, because there aren't a lot of trees left after you start mowing and not, you know, tilling and not to, you know, we, we need agriculture, of course, but um, anyway, yeah, you're right. We'll, yeah. Have, we'll have a future webinar on resilient agriculture. <laughs> yeah, and wildlife That's friendly up. agriculture, I think would be good. Yeah, absolutely. we actually really do. I'm not joking. We actually have, uh, oh, have one. Named, yeah, named Laura Linick, um, who is going to be talking okay. about adaptive agriculture and, and um, a purpose, basically how we can do agriculture to be resilient in um, face of climate. Okay. So, anyways, exciting stuff in the future that you can uh, look for Very that good. on our website. On that. Yeah, in December. Right. Um, in December. Very good. Yeah. So one, I'll just give one last question and then we really are going to close this off. Um, uh, one of our uh, followers- lost a few people, I know, so. <laughs> yeah, Kathleen yeah. just asked, um, how involved are the ornological societies and um, Audubon society in advocating for more bird-friendly cities in a larger biophilic ecosystem? Yeah, they have been uh, critical. Uh, I don't know about so much orn ornithological societies and if this, if that, you're thinking of more kind of uh, scholarly re research kind of, but the Audubon groups around the country, when this bird book came out uh, about a year ago now, I got invitations to speak to just about every bird club and you can imagine it was, it has been a lot of fun. I'm still doing it. Um, and, and the book actually tells a lot of stories, Port Portland Audubon and New York City Audubon. Uh, you know, when you look around the country, San Francisco, uh, places that have done wonderful things, adopted ordinances. New York City basically is now the largest city to, to mandate bird-friendly design, largely because of the work of, of, uh, of Audubon, the Audubon. Audubon is this funny, you know, kind of ecosystem of, of groups. There's the National Audubon, but then there's sort of these quasi-independent, there's state Audubons, and then there are, you know, these city groups, and they, they are a force. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't think, I uh, can't, I can't overstate how, how important they, they have been in put pushing along um, the agenda in, in cities. Um, so one of the things in uh, Portland, Portland Audubon has uh, been joining together with other groups to try to do really creative things. One of the problems that we face is what, what about domestic cats? Um, the, the predation um, of our pet cats is actually a, even a bigger problem than glass and, and windows. So Portland Audubon joined together with the Feral Cats Coalition in Oregon, and they, they are promoting this idea of catios, cat patios, and they do an annual catio tour, which is really, really cool. We made a, we have a short film about that, by the way. I seem to have a film about everything. I don't know. Uh, but that one's really fun. So it's kind of like a garden tour, you know. Every year they they uh, they have 10, 10 catios, and you draw, you know, you, you just follow the tour, and you get to see what ten different versions of a catio uh, can look like. So, but that's the kind of stuff that a that Audubon folks are are doing. So it's really important. Those groups are really important. All right, so I've got people begging uh, to ask some additional questions. So let okay. me just ask you, do you have a moment for a couple more questions or do you need Ooh. to go? Sure, I'm fine. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Um, one of the questions is about synthetic turf and the uh, proliferation of synthetic turf in uh, some of our environments. And uh, okay. just what are your thoughts on synthetic turf? Um, 
I'm not sure I have a very educated answer. I mean, I'm not a big fan of it. I, it it's you you uh, follow, you know, in some places like Los Angeles where they've for for water conservation purposes, right? They uh, they have a, a program basically that that subsidizes the replacement of thirsty, you know, conventional thirsty lawns, water thirsty lawns. Um, and people put in weird things like turf grass um, rather than, you know, a real garden with real native, you know, zero escaped, you know, um, drought tolerant native species. I don't, I don't understand that um, exactly. So I'm not, I'm not sure I'm a big fan of it. I don't, it, it's not very biodiverse or natureful. It doesn't really do much for us in that, that way. It does, it, 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 you know, reduces water consumption. That's, that's one benefit. In that in that scenario, um, I don't know what uh, what are I'd love to hear the thoughts of the of the person posing the question. Are there is that yeah, something you're concerned are, about? Is Kathleen able to mute unmute herself? No, Marco is shaking his head. No. Yeah, but not that. So, no, well, she has put some additional information in the uh, chat. Okay. So if anyone is oh healthy play internet. spaces. Yeah, yes. I see. Okay, so it's partly that. Yeah, I, I had I had those concerns as well. Okay, so if anyone wants to follow up more on that, check out that website and you've got those uh, email contacts that she put in there. And uh, just one last yeah. question, and I really do have to end it after that, guys. We're already <laughs> half an hour okay. past. <laughs> We're going to be so down much. to like three people. So that, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tim. Oh, no, happy um, days. So the um, biophilic practices for reducing noise and light pollution, I know you mentioned yeah. the dark sky um, standards right. and everything, but is there any other places you would direct people to look? Um, yeah, there's a lot of information about lighting, right? And it's um, either the um, International Dark Sky Association is probably the, really the best place to go. Uh, you know, wonderful material um, on, the, on the lighting issue. On, on sound um, and noise, um, you know, there's a, an active discussion of, about this. We are big believers in uh, the need to think about both reducing noise from the perspective of health, but re reducing uh, particularly car car connected noises and construction noises and 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 a lot of good work that our that cities are doing. So so uh, Washington D.C., one of our partner cities, has adopted a, a ban on on um, uh, gasoline powered leaf blowers. So I think that's wonderful, um, and not not everybody's happy about it. You know, it was tough. The landscaping industry wasn't too happy about that uh, when it when it happened. Um, but for anything that can both reduce those kinds of noises, bad sounds, harmful, health impacting sounds, um, will also help to reconnect us to the natural sounds. Um, we'll be able to hear those sounds in a way that we can't. In many places now, um, so there's a lot of work going on around this. I mean, I don't know that we've done a lot of work collecting codes or ordinances, but we do have a lot of kind of knowledge about it. We won't find a lot of it on the on the web page, but um, the idea of sound maps and and communities actually this is another thing that comprehensive plans don't do much, if anything, about seeing the soundscape not not just as a noise control issue, but rather as a, uh, an asset. Um, natureful sounds being positive. Um, you know, we don't monitor the changes in the soundscape over time. We cut down a forest or, you know, change the, the landscaping pattern. Um, that's actually one of the, the key benefits of native landscaping is that you get crickets and tree frogs and, you know, you get sounds that you just are not going to get with just turf grass. Um, and those sounds are, are not, again, not frivolous. They're, rel they're really important and they deliver real important benefits to us. So I think, you know, our, our plans and planning systems need to do a better job uh, with sound generally. I, I love the fact that you brought that up because when we were talking about the Leesburg Comprehensive Plan, um, I, I had brought up mature trees and the importance of having birds because of the health benefits that birds bring. 
And yeah. the staff looked at me like I had three heads. They're like, what do you mean the health benefits? And it was like a bird song of the psychological yeah. mental benefits that you have. Anyways. You have to keep bringing <laughs> so it up, I think. Point. That's right. So It's a great point. So thank you so much, Tim. This presentation has been amazing. Uh, we really appreciate you uh, spending your time with us and giving us an extra half an hour of your sure. time. So thank, thank, thank you, you so much. And we will yeah. be in touch. That sounds Thanks. good. Take care. Thank, thank you. you.